Here's a dilemma. What do you do with a ruin? I mean, how do we make sense in the 21st century of all those decrepit old ancient structures that are falling over? How do we build now while at the same time maintaining the sense of history and the romantic appeal that makes ruins so beguiling? For that matter, could you ever live in one? In a secluded valley in South Cumbria sits this exceptionally romantic industrial ruin on the verge of collapse. It's recently been classified as a scheduled monument by Historic England, which means any modifications require consent from the Secretary of State. Yet one young Cumbrian couple, Rob and Ruth, have an audacious plan to preserve the magic of the ruin while at the same time adapting it into a modern home. I found it and been obsessed with it for the last seven years. Almost like a bit of a magical place. Rob brought me here the first time I came to meet his parents. I just fell in love with it. It was the perfect location with a river running through it and a lot of green <laughs> trees. Over 200 years, it's had a variety of uses. As a water mill, a blacking mill producing charcoal dust for iron forges, and finally, a pigsty. This project is something that we've been thinking about for as long as we've been together. Growing up in the lakes, there's so many incredible buildings that have just stood for hundreds of years. You should preserve that. You should have to do that. And it, we just haven't been able to get it out of our heads. It's a fairy tale, it's a valley of its own. And that, that's, that's what I love about it. Yeah. <laughs> Rob is 31 and Ruth 27 and they've moved back to Cumbria to live and work here after several years away, at Manchester University, where they met, and afterwards in London. Moving back to Cumbria, it was always just a question of when. Like, that was always the end game. Lake District is an amazing place, a lot cheaper than living in a city, and you get all the advantage of like, living somewhere like this, which is amazing. Until their new home is complete, they'll be living a stone's throw away in this annex next to Rob's parents' house. And to help pay the bills, Ruth and Rob, who's an architect, have established a small architecture practice in Ulverston nearby, working on mixed projects. It's good to kind of work with like small clients, doing the work that you enjoy doing, meeting really nice people that want a bit of good design. I'm intrigued to know how on earth Rob and Ruth intend to keep this tottering scheduled monument standing while adapting it into anything like a comfortable contemporary dwelling. You see, every good ruin needs a tree growing out of it, doesn't it? Hiya. Hello. Hi. Oh, how are you? Nice to meet you. Ruth. Nice to meet you. And you, you're getting your hands dirty. Yeah. yeah. There's something about the place which is very special. All I can hear is water yeah. and trees moving in the wind and the sound of birds. So when you explain this project to people who've never been here, who don't know it, what, what, how do you describe it? Derelict wreck that we're plonking a lovely new contemporary style building inside that's going to be half house and then half a workshop and office yeah. but then something that opens up massively into countryside so big doors that draw back so you can hear all the all the river and a roof garden see so up, up with the trees but we've always wanted to retain what's here if i owned a ruin like this and heritage england decided to suddenly list it as a shady money one i'd i'd want to sell it immediately all of the pressures of conservation and you know kind of the status of every stone and it, a nightmare, no? We would never have knocked it down anyway, even if it wasn't a scheduled monument. We always wanted to keep that little bit of the building's yeah. past, I suppose, before we add our touch. This is an incredibly secluded and very beautiful site. Thank you very much. Yeah. So beautiful, in fact. You know, be very careful, because it's so easy to trash, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rob and Ruth ambitiously hope to avoid trashing the place by conserving the dilapidated, characterful mill buildings as they are, and within the existing walls, slot in an entirely new timber frame structure, as though the new is growing out of the old. 
But first, because these are protected buildings at risk of imminent collapse, they need to be made structurally sound, a job fraught with difficulty and some danger. If, and it's a big if, this first conservation phase is a success, Rob and Ruth will lay new building foundations inside the old structures, then slot new insulated timber frames within them, all capped off with a fiberglass roof to form two new and voluminous larch-clad structures, peeping out from the remnants of an ancient mill. The south building is to be a workshop and architecture studio. The larger north building will become the centerpiece of this project, a 250 square meter two-story home. The ground floor will contain a large open plan kitchen, dining room and living room with a very large seven meter wide window that will visually connect the building to the beautiful river valley just outside. There will also be a more private snug with a wood burner. Upstairs there will be a bedroom for Rob and Ruth along with three further rooms. Above that will sit a roof terrace with food growing, a dining table, plenty of seating and a pizza oven. It's a very imaginative idea for preserving a heritage ruin, giving it new use and also making a new home that's chock full of character from the off. But the design is also complex and hybrid and technically extremely challenging and Rob and Ruth are fledgling self-builders. How much did you pay for this site? Uh, 110,000. And how much is it going to cost to do? Well, we've got about 250,000. That 250 includes the cost of doing the workshops? Yeah. yeah. OK, blimey, right. And, and how are you paying for it all? Going to be selling a flat that I've got in Ulverston. Then my dad is going to be giving a family loan, about 100 grand, and then hoping Which to get... Which is his retirement fund. Whoa! So, no so, he, so he's basically investing his retirement. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Not in, like he's got 100 grand to burn here. No. And then um, we're going to be getting a mortgage as well. You, you knew some of that to repay him? Yes. Very good. Very grateful. When do you hope to move in? We'll be in by December next year, so 18 months from start date. OK. But have you built a house together before? No. Have you built a house before? As an architect? No. No. Have you designed a, a detached house before? No. Nope. I've never designed my own house before. In other words, you're at the jumping off point ready for it. Yeah. yeah. There is no better opportunity than your very own house. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Trial and error on your own house. It is a bit daunting, but we're, we're completely we're, we're comfortable with it. Like, Ruth's going to project manage this build. For the most part, we'll be doing a lot of the work. You've been mucking in yourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Stonework, yeah. doing all the stonework That's ourselves. why we're doing it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I, th I think sometimes in architecture, though, when you're detailing something, you look at some details and they look so complicated. When you actually build something, it's fairly, it's, buildings are simple, really, yeah. especially this type of building. I suspect this project's going to prove exactly the opposite. So I'm trying to get my head around this, because Rob and Ruth have got £250,000 with which to restore and stabilise a crumbling, scheduled ancient monument, and then build a new house within it, down a rather difficult track, which makes the site quite inaccessible. And they're trying to do as much of it themselves as they possibly can. And that, altogether, is about as far from simple as you can get. Before making the mill buildings safe, there's a more urgent task, that of felling 10 big, mostly rotten trees on the steep overlooking hillside, which are at risk of collapse and threaten to destroy the mill directly below. The dangerous trees are right above the house. It's better to do it now than when there's a new building there. It's costing £11,000 for a specialist tree surgeon, Alec, and his team to carry out this extremely difficult work. It's as far as your abilities go, really. <laughs> We've got a combination of it being incredibly steep, really big trees, which some of which are rotten, um, and the access is terrible, so we can't get big machines here like cranes that you normally might use to take trees down like this safely. It's dangerous, and you've got to be careful and have your wits about you. No more so than now. They're about to fell one of the largest trees here, an 80-foot beech beer moth, which, if it falls the wrong way, could crush the mill below. Throw the end of the rope to Nick, he'll attach it to the winch cable, bring the other end back up to us. That's why they've fixed a hydraulic winch to pull the tree diagonally as it falls. Come on, you old bastard. <laughs> Gonna pull from here, that tree, this direction. Quite sizable wood, really. Yeah, so this, this, is, this is one of 
This is one of the biggest trees. It just about misses. What happened to going diagonally over there? Thank goodness the damage sustained is minimal. He'll do. He's down. <sighs> and everybody's still alive, so I'm quite happy about that. Textbook, I don't know. It takes a further six weeks to cut and clear over 150 tons of timber from the site, which is now looking a lot barer. It's been a big change. We sort of the reason we fell in love with it was because it was so green and so natural, but we'll we'll put it back. On the bright side, at least Rob and Ruth are now ready to make their precious mills structurally sound. I say that. But deliberations with Historic England as to how to do so safely last four months and involve Rob and Ruth tirelessly documenting the coursing and the grading of the walls, as well as the location of every coinstone. That's because Historic England's structural engineers have come to a grim conclusion. The structure is too fragile and dangerous to repair and will have to be demolished. Oh, so easy to like, come down. Now this verdant valley and its historic buildings are going. They're gonna have to painstakingly rebuild the mill around their new house. A job harder than ever and absolutely not what Robin Ruth had intended. We would have liked to have kept more of it, but it's structurally unsound. It's, it's sad to see it come down, um, but it had to happen. In just a couple of hours, the 200-year-old South Building has been reduced to rubble. Oh, my word. Oh! It looks like a bomb has hit it. There's nothing left. It's all gone. Rob and Ruth's pioneering preservation project is just months old, but already they've had the worst possible start. The entire structure they wanted to conserve has had to be knocked down by the gable end of the larger north building. Apart from the cornerstones, the rest of the building's been dumped into a huge pile on site. Where's your house? Where's the building gone? Everything, I mean, everything is gone. You just could have got the Royal Artillery in. They could have done, done it in one afternoon. To make an omelette, you've got to break some eggs. You, you smashed the frying pan up. The state that the building was in, it had gone past being able to sort of save it. We have been a bit sad at the end of the day because we felt like we have ripped it out, but we've had to do that. We're sort of trying not to think about it too much if we've destroyed the spirit of it. Yeah, it's sort of gone from this tranquil little location to a building site. Hopefully, once the building's built, we'll be able to turn it into a tranquil location again. I wish I could share Rob and Ruth's naive hope that they can simply recreate the spirit of this place. You know, so often when people buy an old house, they do so for the atmosphere of the place. And then, of course, they rip out all the windows, uh, put in new skirting boards, paint it, and build an extension. And then they're surprised that the atmosphere's evaporated somehow. Well, of course it has, because it's not ethereal. It actually resides in the tens of thousands of tiny details in the place. And so it is with this valley. The trees, the mosses, the, the flora of this place has sort of been stripped out. The buildings have been taken away. And this set of buildings started as a pile of stone quarried from the cliffs behind me here. And that's what they are again. Oh, dear. So how on earth did Historic England come to the conclusion that it was necessary for Robin Ruth to knock down this scheduled ancient monument? To any conservationist, the idea of demolition is sort of anathema. But this is a most unusual case, dealing with a building that was built as cheaply as possible. They didn't intend it to last for 200 years. It had been uh, abandoned for so long that it really was 
uh, beyond, pretty much beyond saving. You're placing a great deal of faith in Robert Ruth to somehow convey the spirit of what was there, and it's going to be quite hard to reproduce that, I imagine. There's no getting out of it. I will be expecting them to, to, to do their best to, to, to replicate the uh, coursing of the stonework, the grading of the stonework, and the way in which the, the stuff is put back. In other words, Andrew expects nothing short of a Lazarus-like miracle for the soul of the old mill to be brought back to life from this enormous pile of stones. This is not a job I would happily take on, I have to say, myself, at my age. I think I'd be too paralysed by the scale of it, really. Would you do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> the simple fact is that transforming any ruin for the better is immensely difficult. These photographs from 20 years ago show Astley Castle in Warwickshire, a fortified medieval manor house now owned by the Landmark Trust. It was a completely ruinous site. There was a devastating fire in 1978, which gutted the building. But then you have to imagine another 20 years of encroaching weather and the walls exposed and left to the elements very soon began to crumble. So it really was in danger of collapse. The future of Astley Castle was really hanging by a thread. Yet, thanks to the efforts of the Landmark Trust and their architects, today, Astley Castle is not so much restored as reincarnated. That is just magnificent. <sighs> what a thing. That is a castle that has risen from the grave. Oh, oh. oh, this is beautiful. The decrepitude is beautiful. The new work is astonishingly beautiful. Crumbling walls have been capped and secured and there's now a thrilling new two-story brick structure that's been stitched into and through the ancient fabric of the place. This is not restoration, and it is not conservation. Is there a term to describe your overall approach? I suppose I'd call it transformation. The longevity of a building is something that you can use and kind of riff off, and it has this sort of fantastic pattern and quality, but then you change it, stabilising it, but... Um, making it something that it never was. Yeah. If you start touching this, it, you know, where do you, it, stop? where do you stop? Where do you stop? Pries off a metal edge and then the tiles come off and then you have to start fiddling yeah. with the floor. And so, don't, don't go there. This is the sort of respectful approach Rob and Ruth had hoped to undertake, but one that's sadly no longer available to them. Is it feasible to demolish entirely? And can you carry an echo of a building forward that isn't there anymore? in another building. This idea that you wipe the slate clean and start again, um, it's kind of pretty problematic. I guess if you do it with energy and invention and courage, you can take a bit of charge from a, a bit of stone or a bit of wood, but there is definitely a landscape presence or a memory in yeah. the place that is worth kind of respecting. Look at this ancient plaster and paint just left, complete with cobwebs and bits of rubbish. John Ruskin, in the 1840s, he wrote about the souls of ancient buildings residing in the last half inch, that actually, that it was all this that made the character of a place. And, of course, Rob and Ruth are not scraping away the last half inch there. They're scraping away the entire wall. Rob and Ruth have been forced to revert to plan B. They'll now need all the optimism and courage they can muster to make their full reconstruction a success. Helped out by Rob's dad, they start by building new foundations for the contemporary structure that'll sit within the old walls. Well, the plan today is to dig the foundations and get it set out, ready for concrete tomorrow, all ready for a nine o'clock start. But digging foundations so close to a river inevitably leads to issues. We've got our own pool. It's like a moat here. So we've got a generator and we've got a pump. 
So in the morning, we're going to pump out the water and then hopefully it won't flood. <laughs> Fingers crossed. There's always going to be a risk, but we're prepared for it, so it should be fine. Not worried about it. But the following morning... Yeah, it stopped again. Shit. Why is it doing this? That pump's absolutely useless. Thanks to their old water pump, the foundations are still full of water and the concrete trucks expected imminently. Too much faith in one pump. The water there's starting to go back in. If the poor can't go ahead today, they'll have wasted hundreds of pounds. All right, concrete's here. Right. Luckily for them, it's taking time to reverse the truck down the narrow lanes. OK. Although it soon transpires there's a more urgent problem. Access. The Grade 2 listed bridge onto site is too narrow for the concrete truck to get over. So they enlist the narrower dump truck to get the concrete to site. Well, I'm just saying I hope I can get the height to go in there. Mark. Only now they can't get the dumper under the spout. They're going to have to improvise. Hey, Mark. Have you got any for out? So, something that I can reverse on and I'll be higher than this. So this, this wood's just from like the old building, so it fits the timber that were in the floor and that in the roof. Never take anything off site because you'll always use it. Yeah. Is that enough? It should be, yeah. Finally, they can transfer the concrete onto site, by which time, mercifully, the foundations are free of water. It should be plain sailing now. By 3 o'clock in the afternoon... Bye now. ..the foundations for their new home are complete. Foundations. Yeah, we've actually made progress, which is good. The next step is to lay the block and beam floor on which the new timber frame home will sit. Four and a half months into their 18-month schedule, they seem to be on a roll. So how long then to get your block work up and your beam and block floor in? This week, we've got eight weeks to get the block and beam in, which is fine, plenty of time. We've got eight weeks until the timber frame turns up. Windows will go in shortly afterwards and then we'll be, hopefully, watertight for Christmas. Seriously? Yeah. But Ruth's optimism turns out to be optimistic. The drawings for their timber frame make it clear that the new foundations alone aren't going to be enough to safely support the enormous weight of the timber and steel structure above. An engineer has advised Rob and Ruth that they need to install a capping beam to more robustly join the new foundations with the original stone wall. It'll take time to design and build. Because of the size of the building and the sort of the expanse of the and the open plan, the capping beam has to has to be in there to sort of enable to spread the load. It's a major setback, and as a consequence, it's six months before concrete's being again poured into the more robust foundations. With a trifling budget, thank goodness there's an unskilled, i.e. free, labour force ready to help. Today is very much a family affair. Robert and Ruth, of course, myself, and then Robert's uncle and his friend, all chief labour. I've done some labouring in the past, and we're a close family, and we decided just to help. You can see where the sort of final floor level is going to be now. So yeah, it's really exciting. Unbowed, Rob and Ruth's determination to keep going is remarkable. It takes a further five days to install the 125 beams and 1,600 blocks that make up the ground floor on which the timber frame will sit. I think we've done a good job. It's taken quite a bit of time to do it, but it's a money-saving thing. It's been interesting doing it, and we've learned various things along the way. Despite the hiccups, having done so much of the work themselves, they've spent a mere £40,000 of their £250,000 budget, half what you'd expect at this stage. The knock-on, though, everything takes so much longer. By the time the timber frame arrives, Rob and Ruth's original 18-month schedule is almost up. The frame company have to get around 12 tonnes of steel and timber over the tiny listed bridge. That's down to Tom, their installation manager, and his telehandler. 
Yeah, we've got some big steel there, quite quite a thick gauge. I'm quite surprised that they've actually been able to access it as they have, really. It takes the professionals three hours to transport the ground floor steel and timber bit by bit onto site. Now they need to assemble the steel frame and structural insulated timber panels that'll make up Rob and Ruth's new home. Oh my God, it's so weird. It's so strange. That is five years of work, five years of staring at a computer and it going up. A week on, the ground floor structure is complete and it's finally possible to get a sense of the footprint of this building. That building is twice as big as I thought it would be. How are you? All right, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, yeah. The most extraordinary thing about walking around the corner is that it's here. It's, you think, how did it get here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's bigger than I thought it would be. Yeah. It's, yeah. As is the interior. Thanks to these chunky steel beams, the huge open plan ground floor has the makings of a breathtaking living space. This is your big window. This is yeah. the big window. Big With the view out to the rock. Yeah. That's going to be glazed, that opening. Yeah. Openers? Yeah, yeah that's three, three, openers. three big panels. Yeah. So you can open that, yeah. and the entire building will then reverberate to the mm. sound of the water. Yeah. 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 That's all very tantalizing. But first, Rob and Ruth face a somewhat epic task, one they hadn't ever expected, but one which is now going to determine the success or failure of this project, the painstaking reconstruction of a ruin around the new timber and steel frame. You're going to try and reinstate the echo of the old mill? Yes. Yeah, I pay homage to what the building was and reuse the materials that were on site. So the wall's going to come in what about, about here kind of thing? Yeah. yeah. You're going to suggest as though somehow this is sitting within yeah, like the old wall. Put it inside it, yeah, like we've dropped it in. What I absolutely loved about this building was the look of it and the look of it in its ruinous state. Yeah, yeah. see, so my problem there is it's no longer a ruin. It's, a kind of, it's been dressed. From the point of view of historic England and conservation, the thing is that you, you've got this obligation to put something back. Yeah. How are you going to detail that? Okay. We'll figure out when it starts getting built. Maybe Rob's laid-back approach is right. Maybe what's needed is an homage. One thing's for sure, you cannot fake history. So this wall sits just down the valley from the Blacking Mill, built from the same stone at the same time over 200 years ago, covered in moss and ferns and algae. It's something that can only have emerged here with the passing of time. And yet, Reproducing it is sort of what they have to do. I just don't know how they're going to do it. Because no matter how hard you try, it's going to end up looking slightly as though it was designed by Walt Disney. Rob and Ruth's radical reinvention of a dilapidated Cumbrian mill is going slowly. They thought it would take 18 months. After nearly two years, the demolished millstones still lie in a huge pile on site. Meanwhile, their new home consists of a conventional timber frame and, as of today, a conventional fiberglass roof. Radical indeed. We've made this like temporary structure over it so we can work underneath it so when it does rain, we can, we can still sort of be productive. Six months since the timber frame was erected, Rob and Ruth still haven't started rebuilding the demolished stone mill around the frame. So what's held them up? Hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. Hello. There's a lot of experimentation with this building. Yeah. And it's not a yeah. standard building, like the way the, the walls are going to be rebuilt looking like a ruinous wreck, how they interact with the cladding, how it comes down, that detail. It's a lot, like, it, mm. I've made it really, really complicated for myself. Clearly, it's taking its toll. I mean, it's, it's, it's demanding a lot of intellectual energy, isn't it? Yeah. And emotional energy. Yeah. Yeah, so have you much sleep at the moment? No. Not really, no. We're absolutely shattered. Because right now, you need a lot of support, don't you? It's yeah. more just, like, emotional support, isn't it, of kind of ringing up, having a cry. Because now, you just want to get finished. 
Thankfully, late spring sees an important milestone reached with the installation of 38 prudently sourced windows at a reasonable cost of £28,000. It's just going to be nicer to work in here because it's quite cold. Rob and Ruth aren't afraid of hard work, saving several thousand pounds installing a weatherproof membrane themselves, stoically determined to keep going no matter what. But this slow rate of progress, now over two years, hasn't escaped the attention of Rob's dad, Paul, an eminent engineer who recently finished his own project, the timber bridge next to Rob and Ruth's home. Does it surprise you that, that it's been as slow as it has been? Um, well, Robert and I are quite different in our background. Ro Robert's much more, it'll get finished when it gets finished. Yeah. Whereas I've been used to managing projects to strict deadlines, and that's what I'm used to. Yeah. So I've had to kind of stand back a bit. I sometimes have to bite my tongue, but that's just, just the way we are. Yeah, well, you're the father of an architect, of course. The engineer you? and the architect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. Yeah, I just, I'm here to help whenever you want. You know, they're on a big learning curve, but they're learning fast and learning good. Yeah. As long as they've got the power and a water supply and uh, it's habitable. But even these bare necessities can't be taken for granted. The cost of getting power to their new home has proved a real shock for Rob and Ruth. We had a quote for the electric connection, which came to 15, 16 grand, which is so much money. Uh, we then found out that the heat pump that we want to use uses too much electricity. They're saying that we need a, a better connection. So we then got another quote and it was 40 grand. Just to connect up to the electric line, that is the that is the cost of our whole structure of the house. Don't have 40 grand to pay for an electricity connection. It's absolutely devastating really, isn't it? It's another stomach punch for Rob and Ruth. They'll need to fight in their negotiations with the electricity board. There is so much uncertainty still hanging over the project, so it's a welcome relief. Every stone always needs a bit of hammer work on it. Not, you can never just pick them up and put them on. All right. When the masonry of the old mill once again starts to rise up, it's in the hands of professionals, Neil and Hayden, proper stonemasons. That one needs to move up closer to that one, just so it's tired. I'm getting dogged here. <laughs> Well, when they first approached me about it, they, they said they wanted it to look like it was crumbling down, so I was, I was a bit worried, really, how they wanted it to look, because I want the stonework to look nice and neat. Not really sure how that's going to work yet. It's nothing we've ever done before, so it's just going to be a bit of trial and error when we get to it. Like everything else on this Rites of Passage project. Yeah, it is a big job. And <laughs> It looks so much better than if we were doing it. It's good to see crafted people doing it. Yeah, it's class. Well, Ruth likes the stones with the moss on, so she keeps bringing over stones with moss on, and she's like, can we, can we put this one in? Usually, a, a, a stone waller is expected to do about two square metres a day, so me and Hayden should be doing four a day between us, and I think there's about 170 square metres to do in total, so you can do the moss. That's eight to nine weeks, by the way, and craftspeople cost money. One of the reasons Rob and Ruth have upped their mortgage by 50 grand, bringing their revised budget to 300,000 pounds. By the time I check on Rob and Ruth's progress, it's almost three years since they started out on this increasingly bonkers scheme. <laughs> Bit of green and splodge of moss <laughs> on you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. This is utterly astonishing. I, I, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. I mean, I don't quite know what to make of it because it's sort of so unusual. Still such a crazy idea, isn't it? You kind yeah. of make a ruin. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's because this place is in a valley, it's so otherworldly. You turn yeah. the corner yeah. and you're, you're visiting a sort of a, I don't know, some extraordinary enactment going yeah. on. You know, some crazy American director wants, you know, a ruined mill in a valley in northern England. But Rob's grand vision isn't complete yet, because out of the ruin will grow the larch-clad timber frame, which the two building goblins naturally set about installing themselves. Of course they do. After which, their attention will need to shift to fitting out their enormous 300-square-metre home and workshop. But by gum, three years into this astonishing scheme, 
I'm finally beginning to think Rob and Ruth might just put something magical back here. Back in 2018, a young Cumbrian couple set out on a bonkers inspired plan to conserve a romantic ruin, a blacking mill that was a scheduled ancient monument, while transforming it into a super modern home. And my, have Rob and Ruth found some grit and resilience along the way. This project has taken three and a half years. So there better be something to see, and it had better be good. So, have they somehow recaptured the spirit of the ancient mill that once stood here, as well as fashioning a brand new home? Oh, heavens. Well, that is good. <laughs> oh, my word. Staggering. Well, yes, I think they have. The expertly fitted stonework gives the building gravitas more than a hint of the old ruin that once was. That's beautiful. A loose skirt of leadwork provides protection to the walls and connection to the timber structure. And it is monumental. I mean, goodness me, even the timber works monumental. And the slick vertical larch cladding really does give the impression that the new building is sliding up and out of the old rebuilt mill. Hey. Hello. I was Hello. passing. I followed the heritage signs and discovered. <laughs> A big thrusting building in a valley. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. So you no longer look like building goblins. You've morphed back into human beings. We're buzzing, aren't we? Yeah. It's so good. We're very proud of it. There are some moments of delight, like the returns on the timber cladding on mm -hmm. those windows up there and the sharpness of that profile of the gable and the, the lead work on the stonework. Mm -hmm. And then actually the, the stonework itself, exquisitely done, properly crafted. And are you pleased with the quality? Love it, yeah. It's ama really yeah, quality's it. amazing. I think it's a new interpretation of what was here. If you, if you re rebuild a wall, even using the existing stone, it's, it's always going to look new. But then we've kind of copied the shape of what it was, yeah, trying to show what was here. We're very proud of it. Yeah, yeah. and well, it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it has. We've just been doing 18 hour days. <laughs> I think, yeah, you do have to sacrifice having any sort of social life. Well, congratulations on getting it to a point where you can live in it. Let's have a look inside. I'm not sure what kind of spaces to expect inside this place, given the multiple personalities of the outside. Oh, my, this is giant. I like what you've done to the beams. They're good, aren't they? I think that's really clever. That one's orange. Yeah. This one's green. Yeah. Is it, uh, this one's pink. Yeah. Well, this is it's exciting, this building. I love being in it. The furniture's beautiful and it's very considered. And I'm assuming you've made a lot of this or had it made. Yeah, my cousin, my cousin made it. Really like, nice. And nothing gets in the way of these views, which are so strong that it's almost like standing in a gallery. It's something else. Now, what do you need to paint your beam orange? And that window, that vast window, which is panoramic, like a super widescreen cinema screen. I expect suddenly to see a, a wild bison to emerge through the woods or a polecat to come and drink yeah. water, you know? It sort of almost completely fills my field of vision. The interior couldn't be further from the original old ruin. It's the modern home they always hoped for. And as it turns out, with really progressive sustainability credentials to match. So this beast, <laughs> This is a sort of powerhouse for the whole building. It's not just providing you with a flame in winter, then, this. This is doing a job. Yeah, it's our heating. So your house is so well insulated, this machine should be able to heat the whole thing? Yeah, yeah I think, think so. so. Because we've got, a, like, a mechanical ventilation system, it should transfer that heat through the house. Around really. the building? Yeah, we, like, we're future-proofed um, in case it isn't enough, so we've put underfloor heating pipe work throughout the floor. We, want, we just want to see what it's like to start so, with, just with that. Where does your timber come from? I mean, a lot of it, of course, Ours. from stuff you've felt. Yeah. Yeah. Carbon-free yeah. fuel. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of insulation, we've insulated to, like, passive standards, so we are... Yeah, we are up there with a really, really well-insulated house. 
As to the cost of their electricity connection, Rob and Ruth's persistence paid off. They're now only having to pay £16,000, not £40,000. It's no wonder it's taken three and a half years to get here. And they still don't have a working kitchen. I mean, what's the deal? So this will eventually be a workbench for the workshop, but at the minute, it's perfect. There's a kitchen island. It's a camping stove. Everybody else has gone on holiday this year, and they've had to battle with these things in a field. Yeah. And you romantically have decided just to buy one at home. Yeah, eventually we'll, we will have a kitchen. I can't imagine you two ever just buying a kitchen from a catalogue. Yeah, exactly. You'd, you'd want to make it yourselves, wouldn't you? The philosophy of this entire build. I am going to retract that statement I made earlier about you looking like human beings again and not building goblins, because, <laughs> in fact, you're really happy building. You're really happy just getting on with it. The pleasure comes from actually, like, doing it. For two people who are addicted to the process of building, you've got the perfect business, haven't you? Building yeah. other people's houses for them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank goodness Rob and Ruth do have a bedroom to get some rest, because their toil will likely continue for some time. Yet to be complete are three more bedrooms, their workshop and office, and their entertainment space where they'll also grow vegetables. The roof garden. Big, isn't it? It's the whole footprint of the building. So what is your plan for up here? They'll all be clad in large, they'll be the same as... So when you're looking, it'll just be timber everywhere. And then we'll have, like, certain areas that are, like, properly raised planters, pizza oven, barbecue, yeah. green, <laughs> greenhouse. With, with enough... With a greenhouse? Yeah. yeah. Great. And enough space for people yeah. to yeah, yeah. come and have a drink and... It's good for stars as well. I love this building. I think it's one of, one of the kind of great delights of it is this space. All enclosed by the beautiful valley, stripped bare just a few years ago, yet already lush. This project was an intellectual and creative challenge, a puzzle that would confound many architects, let alone one designing a house for the first time. I've watched him from afar, you know, how he gets on with the tradesmen, his communication skills, his teamwork with others, and I think, well, that's great, that's my son, you know. I feel really proud of, of that. I like to get things done a bit quicker, but it's his place, it's him and Ruth's place, they do it as they want to do it. Uh, and I'm really chuffed as to what they've achieved. Rob's dad should be. Rob and Ruth have overcome some almighty challenges, designing on their feet, doing the lion's share of the work themselves, all on an extremely tight budget. So, by the time you've finished, how much will you have spent? Are you uh, intending originally to spend 250? We've spent 300. How many square metres have you got? Uh, 300. 300 square metres? and £300,000. That's a £1,000 a square metre. People can't build social housing for that. And this is a complicated job with stonework and a scheduled ancient monument. You spent a 1000 quid a square metre. It's like, that's <laughs> super, super cheap, like impossible cheap. Uh, but it's taken a lot longer. 18 months versus three and a half years. That's yeah, a big difference. But the reality is that, you know, we're self-employed. We've got to fit everything around it. Stuff happens, COVID happened. You know, we've never built before. Certain things just end up taking a lot longer than you think. So, but you seriously are kind of still in love with the process of building? I think sometimes you kind of... You just need a break, both of you Yeah, I think I got yeah. a bit obsessed with the build at a certain point, and, yeah, there's been... Yeah, we've had our moments, but it's, it's a stressful thing. You're going to require some therapy to help you re-socialise, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> yeah. So how many bedrooms have you got upstairs? Four. Four? And uh, that's for a lot of that's for a lot of people. Big family. It, big big family. Big party house. That's exciting. It's, yeah, it's well yeah. exciting. It does mean you yeah. have to stop work when they come. That's fine. I know. And, and do oh, something God. social. Exactly. It'll make us do it. We've got this massive table for people, to, everyone yeah. to sit around, and nowhere to provide food. Yeah. What <laughs> <laughs> campstone? What an amazing campstone. Oh, sorry, you've got the you've got the camping stove. Yes. You just need to get one massive pot, don't we? Uh, sorry, the food's not ready yet. It'll be another four and a half hours. <laughs> no. <laughs> This is not the building that I, or I suspect you, expected to see. The old ruin reincarnated in an altered state. And to be fair, Rob and Ruth wanted to keep the old place. They would no doubt have merrily carried on repairing the building for 30 years and gone bankrupt in the process. So I think I prefer what happened here. As it is, the stonework has not been disnified. The craftsmanship of the work redeems and elevates it. So just to be clear, 
This is not a conservation project. This is not a restoration. This is a new building. But it makes an important contribution to the industrial history of this valley. Now think of it, if you like, as a sort of tribute building, as a, a riff on the past or, or a, a, a retelling of an old tale. And in adding that new chapter, it does something really important. It ties in Rob and Ruth's story to this place. And it does so with big themes about work and toil, about the way that memory can be embedded into stones and the way that we use buildings to connect us to place. Actually, come to think of it, those are some of the greatest ambitions of architecture, aren't they? Because it's on a flood plain, it's built to withstand a once in a thousand year flood. People do get stressed building. Oh, I'm stressed. I'm looking forward to it. He will get stressed. It's a big cantilever. No one's ever built anything like this. Unfortunately, Jeff hasn't got the knowledge to do a job of this magnitude. You're just putting more and more time on it, isn't it? It's going on and on and on. Why did I do this? It looks less 21st century contemporary architecture and a little bit more bungalow on a box.